I'm going to, I'm really going to try to give an overview of, of more of uh, a lot of background on AV biology, how it's been developed into a vector, a little bit of historical context. Um, so uh, to try to give a, you know, just a basic foundation and then the, the next talks will really go into uh, vector development uh, or capsid design and then immuno, uh, immune studies. So uh, the topics that I want to try to go into a little bit of detail is, you know, comparing wild type AAV, how that was discovered, how it got uh, converted um, uh, into recombinant AAV, a little bit about uh, AAV uh, genome design, cellular trafficking and, and binding, uh, capsid structure function, and then just kind of threw in everything else that I could think of in the end. Um, so, as, as a starting point, you know, I want to give a little bit of, um, uh, you know, certainly more than a mention to the, the first description of AAV that came out in 1965. So, over 50 years ago was when AAV was first discovered and published in science as a contaminant of adenovirus stocks. Um, and kind of as a fun fact, if you go back into that literature, uh, AAV can actually, you know, attenuate the uh, replication production of adenovirus. Um, so it's, it's not just a non-pathogenic virus, it, it can actually inhibit the pathogenic virus. Um, so it's in the parvovirus family. Uh, it's a, um, uh, you know, it has a protein capsid, it's non-enveloped. And it was uh, put into this genus Dependovirus because uh, AAV is, is sort of unique in that it is not capable of replicating itself. It needs a helper virus, um, such as adenovirus or herpes virus, to sort of prime the cell to enable uh, replication um, uh, and transmission. So the genome of AAV, uh, well, and, and just going back, uh, you know, this electron micrograph that showed up in that first paper, you'll see one adenovirus particle in there. Uh, the scale bar is 100 nanometers, um, so you can see adenovirus is, is quite large and AAV is about one-fifth the diameter. Um, and, and so you can even see some empty and full particles on that stain. <clears throat> so, um, so AAV has, uh, you know, as with most viruses, it has a very compact, efficient genome. Let's see, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point over to this one over here. Sorry for you uh, on, on your side of the room. But uh, the, the way that the genome is designed, it's a single-stranded genome. It has these, okay, maybe I won't. Okay, has these uh, um, uh, inverted terminal repeats on one side or the other. And, uh, and it has three promoters that can drive expression. Uh, it has actually three open reading, well, multiple open reading frames, but you basically have uh, um, the two open reading frames that can encode different forms of rep. Uh, this is the um, protein that's involved with AAV genome replication and then packaging into the capsid. And then you have the uh, um, cap open reading frame that, that uh, basically through alternative start sites um, and uh, then you can generate three different uh, capsid proteins. All of them will be, all, the, all three capsid proteins will be conserved in this VP3 region and then the other two capsid subunits, um, they only differ by the addition of a, a, uh, additional amino, um, sorry, N-terminus. Um, and then kind of, you know, we, we thought that we had um, a pretty good understanding of this virus. And then a few years back, it was discovered that there was another, um, another open reading frame uh, and, another, and another protein uh, after, after um, you know, having been studying this virus for about 40 years and nobody really recognized this, you had this AAP, um, this AAV accessory protein that was discovered as an out-of-frame um, uh, um, protein embedded within the VP, or the, the viral protein um, cap gene. And since it's out of frame, I think this solved a little bit of a mystery because, you know, people had been trying to manipulate some of the wobble bases within the capsid gene and, and you could, you know, you can um, change some of those wobble bases and then it won't make AAV anymore. And it turned out those, those would have been mutations that uh, inactivated AAP. Um, <clears throat> and then a, a key, key function of this is that the wild type AAV genome is about 4.7 KB. 
and that's, that's a pretty hard and fast rule. You really can't package much more than that. Um, and then, you know, lastly, when you look at the capsid, the, the intact formed capsid, it's a ratio of VP1, VP2, and VP3, where most of the capsid is made of VP3, and then you have a few VP1 and VP2 um, uh, proteins incorporated. So the, the, um, if you're just looking at wild type AAV, you know, the life cycle is that you can have, um, uh, as with many viruses, AAV can undergo a lytic infection or a latent infection. And so you, you, you basically have on, um, let's see, on your left uh, would be the latent infection, and this would be the default infectious pathway for AAV, uh, where AAV will infect a cell, and wild-type AAV uh, can, can integrate into a specific location in chromosome 19 in humans. And, but that integration event is dependent on the rep protein. So recombinant AAV won't go down this path. This is something that's only um, wild-type AAV. And then so you can uh, either go with a latently infected cell that has uh, AAV incorporated. That can be activated by subsequent, it could be years later, um, infection of, of a helper virus like adenovirus or herpes virus. And then that will basically prime the cell and it will activate the AAV genes and, and you basically have a reconstitution um, where AAV will start to replicate and enter a lytic infection. Um, so, you know, recombinant AAV, uh, um, you know, will more or less, you know, go down that latent infection pathway, but without the chromosome 19 um, integration. So, you know, the, the key principles of how to make AAV is that you'll have, you know, again, you have the wild-type AAV genome that has the ITRs, it has all the viral genes, and the way that you'll, you'll make this in a recombinant system is you basically separate out those elements. Uh, you'll, you'll um, on, on your right, uh, you can basically take out the AAV ITRs, you can uh, put any other piece of DNA in between them, uh, within the size constraints, <clears throat> and then on your left, uh, you, can, you can separate out and provide in trans um, the AAV genome in its entirety without the ITRs. And so you have those two components that are now separated out, and, uh, and then you have to provide the helper virus genes in trans, um, again, to sort of prime the cell um, and, and enable the replication. Um, and one thing that I want to point out here, uh, when, I, when, I drew, when I redrew this, it's, um, I redo it with AAV2 ITRs and with AAV2 rep. So if you have that system where you have AAV2 ITRs, a, uh, AAV2 rep, and any other capsid gene, then you can, you can basically cross-package this genome into any other AAV capsid. There are a couple exceptions of that. You have things like AAV5 capsid that the um, AAV2 rep won't interact very well with. So some of the really divergent AAV capsids, you might have to have a, like a hybrid rep protein. But, but on the whole, this is a nice system because it allows um, you to design one construct uh, with your, your, your recombinant genome and then cross-package that into multiple, you know, dozens or hundreds of different AAV capsids. <clears throat> um, so continuing like how to make recombinant AAV, like I said, you, you have these different features um, uh, that you're, you, you've separated out, and then you provide them all in the same cell in trans. You have the helper virus genes. You have the trans gene flanked by the AAV ITRs, and then you have rep and cap. Um, and so if you put all those into a producer cell, then you'll end up getting out your recombinant um, protein, or your, sorry, your recombinant capsid with the foreign gene inside it. Uh, when we talk about recombinant AAV genome design, I think, you know, really the creativity here is that it, you can put in any DNA that will fit, um, but traditionally, uh, you know, you'll, you'll have, if you're trying to express a gene, of course you have your enhancer and promoter to pr do your primary control of cell specificity and strength, your gene coding sequence, and poly A. That's your basic uh, transcription unit. But, of course, you can get a lot more creative about that, uh, modifying the 5' prime UTR, the 3' prime UTR. Um, and so introns typically will boost expression. Um, 
you know, and then you have things like the uh, woodchuck um, hepatitis uh, promoter response element that can boost expression, um, different microRNA binding sites, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whatever you can design to control the expression of your gene. Um, and, you know, and the important feature here is that as long as you have the ITRs, you can package whatever DNA you want that will fit within the size constraints. <clears throat> now, talking about AAV genome packaging constraints, there's been a significant amount of effort to expand the capacity of AAV. And I will say that the, the core structure of the AAV capsid protein is e extremely well conserved. Um, uh, and, and I think, you know, my, my opinion is that it's going to be very difficult to get this particle to package more, vi or more, more DNA. Um, so what, what ends up happening is you have an ideal situation with your foreign DNA, you know, about 4.6 KB or less. If you try to push this and package more DNA, then, then a couple things happen. One, you'll get strongly reduced yields as you start to get up around 5 KB or, or larger in terms of the size of the genome. And, and what will happen is that the, uh, the AAV, when it packages the DNA, it'll start, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that this is what happens. I think nobody's proved it, but it is that you'll, you know, might take the, the AV genome on one side and start stuffing it into the capsid, and then the capsid's full and it'll just chop off the rest. Um, so what you'll end up with is whether it starts packaging from the right side or the left side, you'll get a mixed population of, um, of particles that contain part of one side of the genome or part of the other side. Now, incidentally, you know, it's been shown by a number of groups that you could do something like this and have a mixed population of genomes. If you put those in the same cell, they will recombine um, at some efficiency. Uh, so so you, can, you can design something where you have, you know, sort of split genomes and, uh, and package a larger gene, but it's, you're really at the mercy of the efficiency that this will recombine um, in, in target cells. So I'm going to take a couple, you know, a, a little bit of time to go through AV genome replication, and I'm, and I'm really providing this. Uh, this can be really dry, and I apologize for that. But um, I wanted to go through this because th there, there is an issue of uh, making self-complementary AAV, and this is something that um, uh, I think is pretty important when you're talking about AAV, but it, it requires an understanding of how AAV replicates. Um, so I really need a laser pointer here, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to walk through it. Uh, when the AV genome goes into a cell, all right, then you'll, you, you know, you'll have a host cell polymerase that will come in and it'll extend the three prime end. Uh, then it'll extend through the ITRs and, and convert those. The ITRs can fold back on themselves. And then you'll have a free three prime OH that can then be recognized by a host cell polymerase and extended out. So then you're, you're displacing the second strand. And now, you know, two things can happen at this point. Uh, REP, one of the functions that REP has is that it will nick the AV genome in a specific, you know, right next to the ITRs. And, and then that will expose another 3 prime OH that can be extended out. And then you can get strand displacement um, uh, where, where when this, when this, copies through, then, uh, then you'll release like another AAV genome, and then, uh, and then this side here can undergo isomerization of, of these ITRs and fold back, and, and it's basically a, a loop that can happen where you can get continuous replication. Um, what'll happen naturally in the course of AAV replication is um, at this point, it, it's kind of a stoichiometry. Some of it can go down this pathway, and then some of it, you'll get failed resolution from rep, and, and then you go on this alternative pathway where you, you basically start replicating a concatamer. Um, and, and this can actually go and expand into several unit length genomes, uh, and, and then they just get resolved as, as rep will come in and nick the ITR. Um, but the consequence of that is that, you know, if you look at step 7M there, you're packaging a monomer, uh, of the genome, and uh, in, in step 10D, you can actually package a dimer, where it's, it's two, um, two copies of the genome, 
one is complementary to the other, and they're linked in cis. And so, um, uh, normally, if it's a f you know a 4.7 KB genome, then you'll go down 7M and you'll only package monomers. But if you if you actually just create a version of the AV capsid that's short, you know about half size, then naturally you will get some of these. You know you'll either get two monomers that package in one capsid. Sometimes you'll get one monomer packaged in a capsid, and sometimes you'll get two monomers that are actually linked in cis as a, as a dimer. Um, and so this principle of, of kind of having that mixture if the genome size is small uh, ended up leading towards the development of self-complementary AAV ITRs. And, um, and the way that this works, like I said, rep, the rep protein will sit on the ITR. It'll interact in this rep binding element, RBE. Um, and, then it, and then it binds the tip of one of the stem loops. Um, and so you can think, you know, one of the functions of rep is it acts as a helicase. And so you can think about it as almost like it's grabbing onto it. And then you have the bars coming off and, and rep is almost like anchoring it and then twisting and then unwinding the DNA. Um, but <clears throat> a, a core feature of rep also is it has this nickase activity. And there's a specific location I've got underlined in red where this actually forms a separate um, stem loop, um, like a, a hairpin structure. And, and then there's a specific location in there that rep will nick. So that, that's critical as far as the replication of the AV genomes, um, that rep has to be able to nick there. If you have two ITRs and neither of them have the nick site, AV can't replicate. But what you can do is you can take one of the ITRs, uh, and, and Doug McCarty and Jude Smolsky did this, right? You know, they published this in 2001, is to make a mutant, of, a mutant version of the ITR that lacks that D element, so it doesn't have the nicking site. And, and, and so rep can't resolve that ITR, um, and, and it forces the genomes to replicate as a dimer. Um, so, you're, so it's basically for, forcing AV down this pathway of, of, um, of packaging a self-complementary or a double-stranded genome. Um, so we can call it like a, a delta D ITR on one side and then a wild-type AV uh, ITR on the other side. Okay, um, so coming back to this, this is just, you know, that, that we're basically forcing uh, AV during the replication cycle, we're forcing it into this pathway on your right um, to package a double-stranded genome. So why is this important? Uh, you know, this is, this is just, you know, uh, work published out of my lab. This is a supplemental figure, so I'm sorry, it's a little hard to find. Um, uh, but this is just looking at two equivalent uh, AAV vectors. One is self-complementary, one is single-stranded. And so if you inject them, um, uh, you know, basically the AAV capsids will take everything to the same location but you'll have persistent expression, a much more efficient persistent expression with a self-complementary genome uh, versus a single-stranded. And, and I will say that if you have applications where you're really saturating a target, like if we're talking about subretinal injections or intramuscular injections or interparenchymal brain injections, you're, you're saturating the target site with vector, so you're not really gonna see a, a big difference between self-complementary or single-stranded uh, AAV. But if it's a situation where it's a diffuse um, administration, something like an IV injection, then, then you will see it. <clears throat> um, so, and this is just emphasizing here, you know, the differences, self-complementary, single-stranded. Transduction, the trans, you know, or the, the cell binding is going to be exactly the same. Trafficking is going to be very much, you know, pretty much exactly the same. But once the, once the genomes are released in the nucleus, um, then a single-stranded vector has to go through second-strand synthesis uh, before you can get, um, uh, you know, an active transcriptional unit. Um, and, you know, self-complementary can go into the cell, it can snap back together and immediately have it be a double-stranded template for transcription. Um, and a lot of the AAV genomes going through second-strand synthesis are going to end up getting degraded by the cell. Um, so none of this is really proven. But I would say, you know, that what, what kind of makes sense is that when you get to the end of this and you're getting st stable formation of an episome um, by AAV, 
then if you're starting off with a double-stranded template, that ends up being a much more efficient process. All right, so I'm going to move past that. Um, so, you know, if we're talking about persistence of recombinant AAV transgene expression, you know, I think the question that everybody asks a lot is, how permanent is expression? How long is this going to last? And the, the key feature is to answer that question, expression will persist well, so, so keep in mind, AAV is going to persist primarily as an extra-chromosomal episome. It is not going to be able to replicate itself, even if the cell replicates. And so expression will persist if targets, targeted cells don't divide. And, and you'll get persistent expression if you don't get the gene silenced. Um, expression will be lost if promoter is silenced if the targeted cell divides, and it's basically just a, a dilution effect. The more the cells divide, eventually you will lose the genomes. Um, and of course, if you get some kind of immune-mediated clearance or, or, or other, other type of silencing, then you'll lose expression. <clears throat> um, all right, so I'm going to move on to a couple other topics. You have AV trafficking. Uh, AV is going to bind to the cell surface. It's going to be endocyte, well, and you, you basically have a primary receptor, which is typically some type of proteoglycan and then a secondary receptor that will mediate it, uh, that'll, that'll um, uh, push it into a clathrin um, or a receptor-mediated endocytosis through a clathrin-coated pit. Uh, AV, you know, the, then this moves into an endosome. The endosome acidifies. That, that acidification um, prompts a conformational change in the AV capsid where you have the end terminus of VP1 and VP2 that get extruded. Um, those have a phospholipase domain that, that, that basically lyses the membrane of the endosome, releasing the AAV, and then it goes into the nucleus. Once in the nucleus, then it, it'll release the AAV genome. Um, so if you look at the capsid structure, um, <clears throat> uh, the first 200 amino acids of VP1 are basically this N-terminal domain that are unique to VP1 and VP2, has a phospholipase domain and a nuclear localization signal. Um, the rest of the, the capsid, this red VP3 specific region, um, then that's going to be, uh, have a number of variable regions and, and very conserved regions. So the conserved regions are going to be the core structure of this icosahedral shape, and then the variable regions will be more of the surface loops that dictate the tropism. Um, so this is just, you know, a slide about known receptors of different AAV serotypes, and you'll note that, you know, even some key vectors like AAV8, we still don't know what the primary receptor is. Um, so we use these things, and AAV2, which is most studied, you'll see that there's quite a lot of co-receptors that have been identified. So I think it, you, you can kind of take it as given that we still don't know, um, you know, we still don't have a comprehensive list of all the AAV receptors. and and it's going to be very diverse depending on the exact uh, capsid variant. So the capsid features, you know, there's 60 subunits that come together to form this icosahedral capsid structure. Uh, like I said, it's very well conserved. If you mess with some of those highly conserved regions, then AAV does, doesn't tolerate that very well, generally speaking. But if you make mutations in the variable regions, then th those are typically things that are tolerated. Um, and, and consequently, if you try to insert large polypeptides somewhere on the AV capsid, it doesn't tolerate that well. Um, most of the uh, approaches to, to incorporate peptides have been like things like 7 mers in, in specific surface loops. So I'm going to go through uh, really quickly um, that you, you know, you've got a monomer that can form a trimer, a pentamer. Those come together to form the 60 subunit capsid. Uh, you'll have three-fold axis of symmetry, five-fold axis of symmetry, two-fold axis of symmetry. Um, so, you know, I think other considerations really quick uh, that I, I haven't mentioned yet. AV can infect dividing or non-dividing cells. Uh, there are over 100 naturally occurring variants that have been identified in nature, and I think at this point there's countless, there's hundreds of lab-derived variants. Um, and... Again, I want to stress AAV will not replicate without co-infection of a helper virus. Um, AAV is, recombinant AAV is not competent for replication. Um, Jude Samolsky, my, my postdoc mentor, coined this term biological nanoparticle, and I think it's, it's pretty accurate. 
And of course, uh, recombinant AV has now been used in hundreds of clinical trials with a quite favorable safety track record. Um, so factors that influence where and how much transgene is expressed, uh, obviously the capsid and the dose will determine how many copies of the genome get to each cell. Promoter and other regulatory elements dictate the cell specificity of expression and, and the overall strength. So, you know, you can play with the promoter and regulatory elements and boost the expression just as well as, um, as, as just using a better caps that are increasing the dose. Um, and then there's this question, does AV vector translate well across model systems? And I'll say, you know, this is something that always has to be considered. It's like AV9 has poor efficiency in cultured cells, but it's one of the best performing capsids in vivo. And, and you have, of course, these reports of this AV9 variant PHPB that work really well in C57 mice, but then don't translate to primates very well. And then, of course, I, I put immune responses. Always think about immune responses, but that'll be a separate talk. And then AV manufacturing, two major platforms is triple transfection of HEK293 cells or baculovirus system using insect cells. Uh, and there's, there's a number of variations on this. And I'd say the baculovirus system typically can get higher titers, but you just have to be really careful about getting the right ratio of VP1, VP2, and VP3. Um, uh, to make sure that your particles are potent. And I'm going to leave off uh, my last slide here is just really this um, concept about disease application and vector needs where, you know, the, the simplest disease to treat conceptually is going to be something where uh, you have like a localized delivery and a secreted factor because then, you know, the, the delivery is easy and you don't have to target every cell. And then the hardest diseases are the ones where really to get your effect, you have to treat every cell all over the body. Obviously, that's a pretty tall order at this point. Um, so I think that I'll end there, and I can take a few questions. Thanks. Any questions? We've got a couple of minutes. So. Yes, up there. I, yeah, so, so the question is really about uh, that he's seeing expression after three days in, after interparenchymal injection in the brain. I think he's being challenged that AV shouldn't express that early. And, you know, if you put AV in cultured cells, you'll see expression within 24 hours very clearly. So if you're doing an interparenchymal injection, I, I don't want to offend your reviewers because there might be some of my reviewers, but, um, but I think, uh, you know, certainly if you're doing an interparenchymal injection, you will see expression probably within 24 hours, your peak expression is probably going to be about two to four weeks or so, and then, and then it should remain stable after that unless you have some kind of silencing issue. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I can't help you with that fight. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, we can take one more. Yes, up there. Yeah, so she's asking about, you know, specifically in the eye, that there's persistent expression for years, but then I, I think there's some, some discussion about that after three to six years or so that you're starting to get a loss of expression. I think that that's a really complicated question. Um, I can speculate, and I'll, I'll take the freedom to do so. Um, you know, I mean, obviously you could get some silencing of the promoter. You could also have a situation, if you're doing interparenchymal injections in the eye, you're treating one area of the retina. And, and in a degenerative disease, you'll end up with one small area of the retina that's healthy, and the rest of the area around it may continue to degenerate. I think that we don't really know what that looks like long term. So it may just be a situation of, um, of you know, a degenerative environment that's impacting a healthy area, uh, neighboring healthy area, I, or, or one of a dozen other explanations. But, you know.
Okay, thank you, Stephen. Thank you.